Good evening, I'm David Brown and welcome to the Northern Sun Experience. With the regular season winding down, Sioux Falls had plenty of goals in front of them. Not only were the Cougars 10-0 with a chance to complete their first perfect season since moving to Division 2, they also wanted to solidify their spot in the playoffs. Step 1 started at home on Saturday, hosting Wayne State at Bob Young Field, and the Cougars march right down the field. Luke Papillion rolls right, finds Brady Rose in the end zone, 4-yard strike, 7-0 USF. Cougar defense was on point most of the game. Zach Osborne chased down by a host of USF defenders led by Michael Mailing. USF only up 13-0 at halftime, but they'd salted away in the second half. Max Mickey with the short touchdown run. And then later in the third, it's Mickey coming right at you. 13-yard touchdown there. Sioux Falls completes the perfect regular season at 11-0 with a 30-7 victory over Wayne State. USF is your NSIC champion. Wild game between 9-1 Minnesota Duluth and 5-5 St. Cloud State. First play of the game for the Huskies, and it's a good one. Nate Meyer rolls to his right and lobs a perfect pass to John Pass. He goes 72 yards down the sideline, and just like that, St. Cloud State has a 7-0 lead. Later in the first, Huskies going for fourth and seven inside the red zone, and the gamble pays off. Meyer to Anthony Carver, great adjustment. Home team smelling upset up 14 zip after one. UMD would finally get on the board in the second. Darren Walker bounces it outside and finds the end zone. Nine yard run cuts the lead in half. But all that work would be extinguished on the Bulldogs kickoff. The Huskies' Nick Greenland finds a lane, cuts back to the left, and no one's going to catch him. 86 yards to the house. St. Cloud State's lead is 21 to 7. They were up 27-14 at halftime when UMD scores three straight touchdowns. First, Drew Bauer to Bo Bofferting on the short toss. He does the rest. 22 yards cuts the lead to 27-21. Next Bulldogs possession, Bauer decides to keep it himself on the read option. Seven yard touchdown, extra point no good, however, so we're tied at 27. Into the fourth, UMD takes its first lead. The short handoff to offensive lineman Nolan Folkert, his fifth rushing touchdown looking like old refrigerator Perry. Minnesota Duluth up 34-27. But the Huskies would respond on their very next offensive play. Jaden Huff finds a crease and it blows by the Bulldog defenders. 65-yard touchdown and just like that, we're tied again at 34. But in the end, UMD would simply be too much for St. Cloud State. Bauer off play action to Tyler Lattery for the short touchdown. That makes it 41-34. And then after an interception, Bauer goes up top to Nate Ricci with the great catch in the end zone, 33-yard strike. Minnesota Duluth emerges victorious in a shootout, 48-34 over St. Cloud State. So with wins from both UMD and USF, the Bulldogs and Cougars are both in the Division II playoffs. For the first time since moving to D2, Sioux Falls will host their first round game. The Cougars are the number two seed in Super Region 3 and take on the number seven seed Azusa Pacific out of California. Adding a little intrigue to this matchup is the fact USF head coach Jed Stewart is an Azusa Pacific alum. He played linebacker and started his coaching career there in the mid-1990s. Kickoff from Bob Young Field is scheduled for noon on Saturday. Meanwhile, Minnesota Duluth earned the number five seed in Super Region 3. They'll travel to Kansas to take on number four seed Emporia State. The Hornets, like the Bulldogs, lost their first game of the season before winning 10 in a row to close. Emporia State was also the team that knocked off Minnesota State in the first round of the playoffs last season. Kickoff for that game is scheduled for 1 p.m. The winner of that game will take on the number one seed in the region, Northwest Missouri State. When we come back, more football highlights from the final weekend of the regular season and find out which non-playoff team earned the prestigious invite to the Mineral Water Bowl. The Northern Sun Experience on Midco Sports Network is presented by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine and Dakota Land Honda. And welcome back. It's been another record-setting season for the Augustana Vikings. The offense has racked up more than 5,000 yards, and Trey Hyde is set to end his career as the most prolific passer in school history. Augustana was among several NSIC teams with a shot at the Mineral Water Bowl, but they needed to take care of business on the road at Southwest Minnesota State. No score midway through the first when Hyde finds Charlie Hayes 35 yards, and it's 7-0 Vikings. Back come the Mustangs. Quarterback Blake Gimble, great fake on the option. Five-yard score, extra point no good, so it's 7-6. Less than a minute to go before halftime, Hyde showing the elusiveness that's defined his career. Eight-yard run, 13-6 Augustana at the break. 
Second half, Hyde lobs it up for Matt Heller. Another ridiculous one-handed catch by the senior. 21-6 Vikings. SMSU not going away. Gimbal with the screen pass to Rafael Lawson Gale. Nice moves along the right sideline. 25 yards. Makes it 21-13 at the end of three. Fourth quarter, Vikings continue the aerial attack. Hyde to Heller, leaping grab over the middle, 21-yard strike, 28-13 Augustana. Mustangs continue to hang on. Gimbal finds a wide open Lawson Gale after he beats his defender. 45-yard touchdown, SMSU back to within a score. But they couldn't quite catch up to the Hyde and Heller show. Another leaping touchdown, this one from 59 yards out. Augustana over SMSU, 35-20. Minnesota State had a chance to move to 8-3 with a win at home against Upper Iowa. First quarter, Mavs on the move. Nick Pierachini throwing it up to Connor McKean. Great dive and catch in the end zone. 25 yards, 6-0 MSU. Peacocks respond on their next possession. Dimitri Morales can't find anyone, so he heads for the right pylon and gets in. Six-yard run. Upper Iowa takes a 7-6 lead. The score stays that way until 12 seconds left in the half. Pierachini finds Ty Dennis on the out. Minnesota State retakes the lead at 13-7. And it's a lead they would never relinquish. Pierachini to Taylor Johnson, four-yard strike, 20-7 Mavs at that point. And in the fourth, Minnesota State runs away from Upper Iowa. Virgil Hammond, seven-yard scamper. Mavericks top the Peacocks, 33-23. Winona State hosting Concordia St. Paul in their season finale. Paul Preston finds the edge for the short touchdown. Warriors up 7-0. 10 zip now in the second when Preston cuts back inside this time around. Nine yards to Pater. 17-0 Winona State at halftime. One touchdown to the left, one back to the middle. So Preston naturally adds a third touchdown to the right side this time. 24-0 Warriors. Winona State with one of their more well-rounded games of the season. Off the punt, it's Elliot Cox finding some space off the right side, makes some moves, and eventually he's going to get into the end zone, 62 yards to the house. And after some offensive touchdowns and a special teams touchdown, how about a defensive one to complete the trifecta? Michael Gomez, the big D lineman, goes 36 yards the other way. Winona State blanks Concordia St. Paul, 38-0. Shootout between a couple of 6-4 and four teams, Northern State and MSU Moorhead. Damon Gibson breaking loose for a 57-yard touchdown, 6-0 Dragons. Later in the first, the Wolves' Christian McIlvain to a wide-open Zach Barber, 67 yards on this score. Northern State takes the lead 7-6. Ensuing Dragons' possession, they go right back down the field. Demetrius Carr rolls left, throws back across his body to Corey Ambrose. MSUM leads 13-7 after one. In the second, the back and forth continues. Off the option, NSU Shaka Kelly gets just enough on the left edge. Wolves up 14-13. Move to the third, Wolves now down 34-21, but sticking around. The reverse to Zach Colbreth. A couple of nice up and out moves frees him up for the 25-yard touchdown. Northern State is within seven, but the Dragons would fly away with another solid air attack. Carr escapes the pressure, fires to Ambrose, who hangs on and runs it in. 51 yards. MSU Moorhead completes a nice 7-4 season with a 48-33 victory over Northern State. Battle of the Big Lake pits the two North Dakota teams together. You marry at Minot State. Marauders up three zip, but not for long. Jose Escobar finds Levante Bushnell in the back of the end zone. Eight yard strike. Beavers take a 7-3 lead. It's 7-6 now in the second when you marry busts out the trick play. Halfback option pass from Zach Graves to Sam Saucedo goes 58 yards. Marauders retake the lead 13-7. On Minot State's very next play, U Mary's lead gets even larger. Jacob Parker, more like Peter Parker with his spidey sense, picks off the pass, goes 26 yards the other way, 20 to seven Marauders. But the Beavers get a break of their own just before the half. Several defenders break through for the blocked punt, and Ryan Fila recovers in the end zone for the touchdown. U Mary's lead is down the 20 to 14 at halftime. It would stay that way until the fourth when Escobar rolls out on play action and hits Ray Watkins for the one-yard score. Minot State retakes the lead at 21-20, and that would be your final, the Beavers over the Marauders in the Battle of the Big Lake. Finally, Bemidji State hosting Minnesota Crookston Saturday. Beavers already up 7-0 and adding to it. Jawan Richard gets the shovel pass, finds a crease and goes up the right sideline. 56 yards to the house, Bemidji State doubles the lead to 14-0. Later in the second, Beavers back to receive the punt, and Gunnar Olszewski makes the Golden Eagles pay. He runs to the left, then cuts back right and uses blockers to his advantage. 72-yard punt return touchdown. 
Bemidji State's lead is now 21-0. Big plays would be the name of the game for the Beavers all afternoon. Jordan Hyde up top to Blake Holder, 39-yard touchdown. It's 28-0. Later in the second, it's Jawan Richard once again. He takes the screen and uses his athleticism to go up the left sideline this time. 55 yards to Pater, 35-0 at halftime. Start of the second half and Richard continues to be a nightmare for the Golden Eagles. He takes this kickoff back 95 yards for the score. Bemidji State had seven separate touchdowns that each covered more than 39 yards. Beavers all over the Golden Eagles 76-13. And with the win, Bemidji State finishes second in the NSIC North and third overall, which gives them a chance to play one more game. Although there were several teams in the NSIC with an 8-3 record, the Beavers will represent the conference in the 51st Mineral Water Bowl on Saturday, December 3rd. BSU will take on Washburn University out of the MIAA. The Beavers' eight wins this season are the most in the program since 2011. When we come back, we look ahead to the NSIC Volleyball Tournament and see where several nationally ranked teams currently stand before Selection Sunday to the National Tournament. Welcome back. As the final weekend of regular season football wrapped up, it was also the final regular season weekend for volleyball. Six NSIC teams have been ranked in the top 10 all season long. We got one final regular season matchup between top 10 teams as Minnesota Duluth visited Winona State. UMD up two sets to none, but the Warriors fighting back. Jordan Runge gets the kill off the left side. Winona State with an early set three lead, but the Bulldogs would claw back and take care of business. Emily Torve to Taylor Wisbroker, too hot to handle. And if it works once, why not do it again? Torve to Wisbroker again for the match point. Minnesota Duluth sweeps Winona State, 3 0. So, with the regular season in the books, these are the matchups for the conference tournament. Concordia St. Paul received the top seed and hosts number eight Minnesota State. Augustana Winona State is the 4 5 matchup. SMSU gets the two seed and hosts Sioux Falls, while Minnesota Duluth and Wayne State are the 3 6 matchup. And in the first round, which concluded Wednesday night, Concordia St. Paul easily got past Minnesota State. Winona State topped Augustana 3-1. SMSU swept Sioux Falls. And Wayne State won an epic battle 3-2 over Minnesota Duluth. That set up these matchups for Saturday. Number 5, Winona State against number 1, Concordia St. Paul. And number 2, SMSU taking on number 6, Wayne State. Taking a look at the Central Region rankings, however, six NSIC teams are still projected to make the NCAA tournament. Now keep in mind these rankings came out on Wednesday afternoon before the conference tournament started, so something to consider as we head towards Selection Monday on the 21st. Switching gears to soccer, and unfortunately the NSIC teams in the postseason had their runs end early. In the first round last Friday, Minot State fell 3-1 to one to Central Oklahoma. The Beavers finished the season with a school record 14 conference wins. Meanwhile, Minnesota State had the number two seed and a bye into the second round, but the Mavs were defeated by Fort Hayes State on Sunday afternoon. After playing to a 2-2 draw, the Tigers topped the Mavs 4-2 in the shootout. When we come back, our Under the Northern Sun alumni feature showcases a former Upper Iowa wrestler still heavily involved with the Peacock program. Welcome back. It's time to name another member to the NSIC's 25th anniversary team. Congrats to former Concordia St. Paul volleyball star Emily Polkert. The 2007 Coaches Association Freshman of the Year, Polkert was also a two-time first-team All-American and won four national championships. Polkert is currently the head volleyball coach at George Fox University, a Division III school out in Oregon. Well, some NSIC athletes attempt to recapture their playing careers by coaching at their alma maters. And while not all of their athletic success on the field necessarily translates into teaching, those who are dedicated to their craft usually fare the best. In tonight's Under the Northern Sun, we check in with one former Upper Iowa wrestler who used his own personal struggles on the mat to teach others how to overcome. In March 2014, Carl Brokhammer was named the Wrestler of the Year in the Northern Sun Conference. Upper Iowa's four-year starter at 197 pounds broke the program record for career wins, ending with 142, including 53 by fall. After becoming an All-American as a freshman, he was named the NSIC's Rookie of the Year. Carl claimed his second and third All-American honors as a junior and senior, 
and earned four NWCA Academic All-American honors as well. I guess if I had to sum it up in one word, it'd be awesome. It was amazing. I mean, I couldn't ask for anything more. Um, I had great coaches. I had uh, great facilities, and um, you know, if there's anything we ever needed or wanted, you know, we uh, everyone, someone tried to get do the best to get us what we needed. As far as uh, competition-wise in the Northern Sun Conference, I think we had a really tough conference, and uh, we saw great competition. Um, you know, we had some really good battles, and you know, that's just that just creates. Uh, Great wrestling matches and um, great opportunities and uh, great memories. Every coach, you know, uh, ideally wants that intrinsically motivated student athlete, which can come and become infectious, uh, becomes an obvious leader. Uh, and that's what Carl was. He was obviously driven, uh, motivated intrinsically. And so um, it, it definitely allowed him to be a leader maybe early on in his career. I had a few uh, injuries, a couple surgeries, uh, one during the summer, one during the year. And um, I guess I kind of let those get to me and I use them as an excuse to not perform or maybe, uh, you know, it's a reason I lost this match because my, my knee hurt or my shoulder hurt. When I finished fifth at regionals, I just kind of realized that, you know, it wasn't an excuse. It was just me being, you know, weak or, ment you know, not mentally strong. And uh, I realized that and uh, I had a lot, a lot of time to think about it over the spring and the summer and then all through that next year. Like, I'm not going to let that happen again, so anytime I had a little tweak, I tried my best to mentally overcome it, physically overcome it. You know, we're all thinking that he's the most winningest wrestler at Upper Iowa. You know, he was the freshman wrestler of the year in the NSIC, and Amateur Wrestling News had him as the top-ranked 190-pound uh, freshman on the all-rookie team, all divisions. Um, he was the NSIC, you know, wrestler of the year to, you know, to end his career on. So, a lot of ups, but... The resolve came, you know, at the national tournaments and rebounding from goals not met by being a, the national champion. And uh, nothing epitomizes that more than after that, you know, sophomore year regional tournament where, you know, he's ranked high in the nation, you know, maybe number two at the time. And he's coming off a third place finish as a freshman and he gets upset. And that was a shocker. And to, to, you know, kids then get an opportunity to go one of two ways. You know, they can start to plateau and say, this is the way it is, um, I, I don't control all these events. Or you can say, hey, I'm gonna learn from this, I'm gonna figure it out, I'm not gonna put myself in the same spot again. And Carr really, I think, used that as more fuel for the fire. And his fire burned pretty hot all the time and that only just erupted into a volcano in those last couple of years. My fondest memory of uh, being a rust peacock wrestler, uh, I, I think back to that match against St. Cloud. It was for the conference title, and uh, Coach Grimm did some bumping up with our 84 pounder and 97. He bumped me up to heavyweight, and I was, uh, I believe, it was number one 97 pounder against number one heavyweight at, in D2. And uh, I, uh, you know, I was pretty jacked up. I could jump out, and uh, the crowd was, everyone was standing. Uh, I believe uh, every seat was filled, and not one person was standing and it was just an amazing feeling. You know, and that's kind of my biggest memories of looking back, I love those home duels. You had the hometown crowd and uh, you know, they always came out, we always drug a good crowd out and uh, it really got you fired up for your matches. I think Carl um, starts, you know, now in year three and four of coaching to understand that it's, it's more than just finding the intrinsically motivated athlete. You gotta work with what you have and to try to get the most out of them you might have to start to, you know, attack guys differently, you know, mentally and physically. Uh, you just can't go in there and just, you know, beat guys up and think that they're going to have that resolve like he had to, uh, to, you know, to catapult them to success. It's a wonderful feeling. Um, going through as a peacock wrestler myself, I got so many great memories, you know, lifelong memories I'm going to take with me for the rest of my life. and. Uh, knowing, knowing that I'm going to have those memories for the rest of my life, I just want these other guys to have that same feeling, create them, help, help them create memories and, uh, you know, achieve their goals, uh, whether it's uh, an All-American ship, uh, academic All-American ship, or a national title. You know, I just, I really get enjoyment now out of it. Now I can no longer compete myself. I help, I get enjoyment out of uh, helping them achieve their goals and their lifelong memories. Coming up next, it's DB's Picks, my top five plays of the past week in the NSIC. The Northern Sun Experience on Midco Sports Network is presented by Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine and Dakota Land Honda.
and welcome back. It's time for DB's picks, my top five plays of the past week. At number five, it's the fifth rushing touchdown of the season for UMD's Nolan Folkert. The 300-pound guard is a dominant force not only on the line, but on the goal line as well, giving his team the perfect back near the end zone. At number four, Zach Graves is digging the option. The halfback rolls right and fires to a wide open Sam Saucedo for a 58 yard touchdown. The Marauders lost a close game to Minot State, but their execution here gets them the fourth best play of the week. At number three, it's more wizardry from the Wolves. Northern State Zach Colbreth takes the reverse, uses a couple of up and out moves to get to the end zone. The Wolves use three of their best players to make play number three a reality. At number two, it's a gunner on punt return, not doing the job of a gunner, but living up to his namesake. Gunnar Olszewski takes the punt, runs left, and cuts back to the right, and guns his way to six points in the second best play of the past week. But our number one play for the second straight week has to go to Augustana's Matt Heller for another ridiculous one-handed catch in the back of the end zone. His career comes to an end as the Vikings' all-time touchdown leader, as well as the leader of my top plays of the past week. Once again, a thank you to all of our NSIC member schools. Despite the holiday, we will be back next week, so tune in after the turkey and stuffing for an all-new Thanksgiving Northern Sun experience.